May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. If you're able, please stand. And a very warm welcome to all of you who have gathered here this morning. This is God's house, and God is the one who welcomes you. And also to those who will be watching later on on our online service again, it's good to have you join us wherever you have gathered. The psalmist writes these words, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit here at my right until I put your enemies under your feet. From Zion, the Lord will extend your royal power. Rule over your enemies, he says. On the day you fight your enemies, your people will volunteer. Like the dew of early morning, your young men will come to you on the sacred hill. And the Lord made us a promise and would not take it back. This morning, let us begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, hymn number 111, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. A couple of things. I don't know what's going on with my microphone this morning, so I will apologise right now. You're just going to have to bear with us. Firstly, I want to uh, remind you all that because we have moved to the unitary constitution, um, that we're asking people uh, to maybe volunteer their time and their talents for some of our groups. And it explains it here. So if you've not received one, please make sure you pick one up. There's some at the table and there's some just outside uh, in the vestibule. The other thing I want to ask you, put your hands up if you're a golfer. Golfer? Well, it's not for me to comment. <laughs> How easy is it to play golf? Is it very difficult, is it? I thought you just got a stick and you whacked the ball and hoped for the best. Is that how you got, yeah, is that basically what happens? Okay. How long does it take you to become a good golfer? Never. <laughs> you're a brave man. <laughs> how long, okay, Helen, because you're a golfer. Are they? Right. So the first two years are awful. The next five years are pretty bad. Right, a decade or so. Fantastic. Okay. Put your hands up if you're a bowler. Right. How long does it take you to do to, the same? So do you have to practice? Do you? How often do you practice? Every day? No, no. Put your hands up if you're a knitter. Right. Any good? How easy is it to knit? You've got to practice? Yeah, maybe. Just hope for the best. No, you don't need to practice. Right, so how did you get it in the first place? Your mum taught you. Right, okay. Um, anyone do carpentry? Nope. Hill walking? I know you do hill walking. How easy is it? It's easy. Right, okay. The hills are hard. Right, okay. And did you have to practice? No, you just hope for the best. Just a wee bit more of that. Okay, okay. Um, what about baking? Yeah, oh, right. Oh, yeah, Mr. Turner, of course. <laughs> Any, how good are you? <laughs> how long did it take you to become a great baker? <laughs> it was in the jeans. Five years apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot you were here. I do apologise. <laughs> I know Eddie. What he's he's in the drinks factory. I am brew, but and it's he's forever practicing. Honestly, honestly. Right now. So it takes time. It takes practice. And quite often, how many times a week, roughly? two or three times a week. Is that how marriage works? Is that why it survives? <laughs> um, so here's my question. If it takes practice to learn how to play golf or bowling or hill walking or whatever, and it takes commitment and it takes time and it takes effort and it's a constant practice and you keep improving, how long do you put in in your own time to read the scriptures? How long does it take each week to read the scriptures, to pray? To pray especially, because that the scriptures and prayer are the bread and butter of who we are. Yes, you're golfers, you're bowlers, you're bakers, etc., etc., but you're also Christian. You wear that badge of honour as a Christian. But to do that, you have to make a commitment to read in Scripture, to pray, to figure out what your identity is in faith. And it's not just, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens, it's life, long life learning 
or lifelong learning. I think that's the phrase, yeah, the wee dyslexic moment there. But it takes time and it takes commitment. But how committed are we as Christians to pick up our Bibles, to read, to study, to pray for each other, for our communities? I'm not going to ask you how often you read your Bibles because that's for you to know. But you have to be challenged. We all have to be challenged in what it means to be a Christian because that is our identity. And, and to be honest, actually, the way the Church of Scotland is heading in the direction, we're going to have to remain strong in our faith. But we can't do lip service to our faith. We have to commit to reading Scripture for praying for each other, creating space that we can hear God's directing us in whatever direction we're going in. But it takes time. And we won't get it right. And as ministers of the Word and Sacrament, we are constantly learning, constantly growing, constantly creating space each week to spend that time. But as Christians, it's not just about a Sunday coming to hear God's Word, coming to hear God's message, and then being sent out to do God's work. We have to create space in our lives each week, even daily, to pray to read the Scriptures because that is who we are. And if we don't do that, then what does that say for us as Christians? Do we not value God's Word? Do we not value God's commitment? Do we not value Jesus' teachings of how to be a Christian? What we should be doing? Because if we don't grasp that, then we might as well not be here. Because it's not just about gathering, which is very important as a Christian to gather, but we also have to be committed to the faith, to our teachings, to our scripture. So I want to just leave that thought for you this morning because we are going to be looking at this over the next couple of weeks during summer. We're going to be looking at... Uh, a minister's book called Sleeping Giants um, and, and that's talking about revival, it's talking about a relationship with Christ and if we don't have that then what is the point? So I just want to, to leave you on that note and for the rest, when you're bowling when you're doing your golfing just practice a wee bit more and you won't be as rotten as what you are saying Anyway, thank you. We're going to sing again. We're going to sing In Christ Alone, which is going to be on our, order, uh, on our screens. Thanks, Christine.
Our reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. So let's listen to God's word. See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. This is why the world does not know us. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now God's children, but it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he really is. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure, just as Christ is pure. And we move on to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Rich people who see a brother or sister in need yet close their hearts against them cannot claim that they are love, that they love God. My children, our love should not just be words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. This then is how we will know that we belong to the truth. This is how we will be confident in God's presence. If our conscience condemns us, we know that God is greater than our conscience and that he knows everything. And so, my dear friends, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have courage in God's presence. We receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. What he commands is that we believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as Christ commanded us. Those who obey God's commands live in union with God and God lives in union with them. And because of the spirit that God has given us, we know that God lives in union with us. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Living God, we thank you. We thank you for the life you have given us and the abundance of your love. You call us to dare to dream, to fulfill our potential, and yet for many they struggle because of who they are and the circumstances that they face. They struggle because they are trapped by the snares of self-contempt. They disregard their own inherent worth and loveliness and yet long to break free. And there are those who are not free to love who or how or where their heart leads them. Lord, reach out to them in love. Lord, hear our prayers for those who long to be free, for those wrongly imprisoned, for those in prison because of a fight for justice, because they spoke out against the tyranny of their government, because they protest the actions for their state, because they have a faith that is centred. For those who seek asylum and refuge from their past and who now live in detention centres. For those who are detained for their own safety and well-being but long to be free. For all those whose freedom falls victim to the greater power of an unjust majority. Reach out to them in love. Lord, hear our prayers for those whose helplessness condemns them to a form of slave labour. For those working unbearably long hours with little or no pay. 
for those increasing numbers of people trafficked, human lives bought and sold. And so we pray for those who long to be free. Reach out to them in love. Lord, hear our prayers for those who know daily pain and who are overwhelmed with the struggle of coping. For those who have a diagnosis that feels like an incarcerating sentence. For those whose health curtails a freedom they used to know. For those who begin the long journey towards you because of health. We pray for those who long to be free. For those who wish to be free of the pain of this life. for those who have loved freely and long to again. Lord, reach out to them in love. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for those who are mourning the passing of loved ones. We remember all those within our communities and our churches who are no longer with us. We praise you for those who in their generation have been light in this world and whose lives we have seen reflections of your goodness and love. We thank you for all that was pure and true, beautiful and good in the life of those we love. So comfort those families with your favour. Reach out to them in love and hear our prayers in this moment of silence.
loving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are the God who loves freely, the God whose love is unconditional and infinite. You love each one of us eternally, so unfold us into your embrace. Grant the freedom of your people and the fulfillment of our prayers. We pray for the sake and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time we're going to sing Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. And again, the words will be up on the screen. Thank you, Christine. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, for you are a strength and a redeemer. Amen. As some of you may know, I am what my son describes as a book dragon, a person who buys books, who holds books and as well as reads the books. And some of you have seen my collection and will agree that there's a few books on my bookcase. From murder mysteries to sci-fi, from theology, spirituality to biblical commentaries, these books are part of me. They are my bread and butter for ministry. They are my escape from the hectic ups and downs of life. And I'm glad to say that my son Adam is following in my bookstakes, becoming a book dragon to the despair of his father. Books are one of those items, those objects that opens your mind to different communities, people and even destinations. And we will all have our favourites. There are three books that I have kept from my childhood a collection of famous five stories which was given to me from my gran, The Hill of the Red Fox, which I read in primary seven, which wasn't that long ago, with Miss Dewar, and Shadow the Sheepdog from my Sunday school prize giving. There is something about these books that have remained with me for all those years, and that is why they sit on my bookcase. But when you think about it, we all love a good story. 
As children, we would often say, can you read it again and again and again? And a good story can be reassuring, comforting, and even calming. And it often has a good ending as well, as they all live happily ever after in those stories. And these are mainly the stories we love to read, especially if the book ends well. We would like to think that our own personal stories are like that, full of good endings, yet if we are honest, it is more like our stories are filled with drama, the ups and downs of life, the joys and the heartaches, the victories and the setbacks. And it's not just books that have an effect. Movies can also do the same to an extent. And so I don't know if you have ever seen the movie Black Hawk Down. The movie retells the dramatic story of a small group of army rangers who flew to Mogadishu, Somalia, to capture a warlord who was stealing American food shipments from the starving Somali citizens. And one of the young men whose life was changed by this brutal battle was Sergeant Jeff Strucker who now serves as an army chaplain. Sergeant Strucker claims that as bullets whizzed past his head and grenades exploded all around him, God called him at that moment into the ministry. As he said, in the middle of that firefight, I had to decide whether I believed what I say I believe. And when I finally answered the question, My faith became so strong, it gave me the strength to fight the rest of the night. And this is ultimately where all of life comes down to, he says. In the middle of that firefight, said Sergeant Stuka, I had to decide whether I believed what I say I believe. And when I finally answered that question, my strength was strong. We all have stories like that in our own lives, not necessarily on a battlefield, but rather in life's challenges. And that is why our faith in Christ is so important, because Christ himself promises to be with us through our own story. Whatever we go through, Jesus Christ promises never to forsake or abandon us. And there lies real hope for each one of us. There lies the real hope. For Jesus promises never to forsake or abandon us. And hope is one of the greatest gifts we can give to those around us. Its power should never be underestimated, especially when we give hope to people when they can't find it within themselves. As many of you know, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, recognised the value of hope during the darkest days of World War II. Churchill was once asked by a reporter what his country's greatest weapon had been against Hitler's Nazi regime. Without pausing for a moment, he said, it was what Britain's greatest weapon has always been, hope. And then when in the Apostle John writes in our, our readings this morning, John talks about the hope we have as Christians. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure, just as Christ is pure. And then he goes on to say, this is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. Real hope is not a wish, but confidence and a certainty. Real hope, godly hope, Bible hope is joyful confidence in something that is certain. And that is the kind of hope John is talking about in his letter. Confidence in the certainty of all we have in Jesus Christ. Real hope in Jesus Christ has the power to change our lives. And the other thing that we don't often expect is the priceless gift that Jesus offers each one of us. A peace that surpasses all understanding. And this is a gift that cannot be bought. For that peace 
comes only within. Wherever Jesus is, that is where peace and hope is found. As Christians, we are also part of a bigger story, not only in Jesus' presence, but in our own personal stories. Jesus is present in the story of the church, which right now in this present climate within the institutional church, I can feel that we have closed the door on Christ himself. To the extent that we have lost hope, that we have lost that sense of peace which we gain from coming to church. We continually cry out about the mission of the church and yet we often forget that Christ is central to the mission of the church. And when you read the scriptures, we are reminding constantly that Christ promises that for the children of God, his church, everything will work for our good and God's glory. That those who trust in Christ will have a happy ever after reading, meaning that no one should perish. Everyone should put their faith in Christ and that you and I cannot simply settle in Jesus' promises for ourselves while forgetting about others. In other words, we are called to live daily with the awareness of Christ's heart for all people and to fully enter into all that Christ has secured for us through his death, resurrection and ascension to walk in all that Christ has won for us knowing that the greater blessing will be that our lives will encourage others to do likewise. But it sounds great, doesn't it? Yet, if truth be told, the church of Jesus Christ is stuck. Many of its people are tired and weary, disheartened and turning away because the church is not making an impact the way it should within our communities. Its people are disconnected from their faith. The relationship with faith is faltering and weakening. They are longing for the Holy Spirit to revive them, to relight that tiny flame to excitement about their faith. We need the Holy Spirit to wake us up from our slumber, to turn our community of faith on its head and in some ways gives us a shake to wake up. I've been reading the book titled Sleeping Giant written by the minister of the Shetland Parish, Tommy McNeil. And Tommy, in his book, Sleeping Giants, writes that we, people of faith, find ourselves in a world we don't recognize and unsure how to navigate. We are living in a season which has left God's people exhausted. We have battled the storms of life and swam against the tide of culture at odds with our beliefs. We have been looked down upon, dismissed and rejected. We have been labelled quaint, old-fashioned, outdated and irrelevant in modern life. As people of faith, we are frequently being laughed at. We've been the object of people's scorn, considered naive to believe in anything other than ourselves. And all of this has taken its toll. And so we find ourselves in a world we don't know, unsure how to navigate it. But despite all of that, we need to be reminded and believe that as far as God is concerned, we are beautiful, brilliant people. We are beautiful, brilliant people. The passion of Jesus is to make sure that as many people as possible come to know Christ and experience his love. We who put our trust in Christ do so with the certain hope that one day we will be where Christ is and we shall be like Christ. But how wonderful and inspiring to know what a glorious future that lies ahead of us. But let's be realistic. 
Many of us are not there yet. We need to be reminded of who Christ is and who we are in Christ. In other words, we need to rediscover our identity and therefore our purpose as people of faith because we are not a community group. We are not a gap place of social entertainment. We are a church that worships Jesus Christ. And we can only remain in that identity and remain in our faith. We can only do that through prayer, reading the scriptures, and seeking spiritual direction. Everything we do and see must be inspired by God, by the teachings of Jesus Christ. If we choose to turn away from prayer, from scripture, from spiritual direction, then ask yourselves, what is the point? Ask yourselves, who are you in this moment? But what will our story look like, especially if we claim to be Christians and yet ignore all that Christ commands us to be? What will the church story look like when everything we do and say in the name of Christ is empty words and actions because we do not believe the importance of prayer, of scripture, of spiritual direction. What will be the point of the church and faith community when even Christ is exiled and abandoned? We need to find it within us to remember who we are in Christ and who Christ is in each one of us. And the simple reason being, we are the church. We are children of God. We are Christians and the followers of Jesus Christ. And yes, the journey that lies ahead of us is challenging in this season. It's fearful, it's unsettling, and that the path that we are called to walk on as people of faith has not been revealed yet. Yet, we must trust. We must keep our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we must find it within ourselves in believing that Christ has a greater purpose for each one of us and his church. That his vision will become a reality and the plans and purpose of Christ will come alive. Christ is calling each one of us to wake up to awake and rise to be who we are called to be. And it's for each one of us to ready ourselves and be willing to write the story of Christ church in our own community. For each one of us are children of God. And it is our time to stand tall in Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forevermore. Amen.
let us pray. Lord Jesus, you gave your life that we might know the full extent of God's love for all creation. Today we offer our very selves, all that we are, all that we can be with your help. Receive all that we offer, time, our talents, and even our money. Take and use it all for the glory of your kingdom. Amen. We have these intimations. Tea and coffee will be served in the large hall at the close of this service, and all are welcome. We need some extra help with the after-service teas and coffees over the summer months. If you are able and willing to assist, please add your name on the relevant date or dates on the list poster on the small hall door, or speak to Liz Vasey. The community cafe will be open on Friday from 12 until 2. Come along and enjoy a bowl or two of homemade soup, tea, coffee and home baking. These are all the interviews. Thank you, Jim. So before we close, can I thank you once again for joining us here uh, for worshipping God this morning and also to those who watch later on on our online service. It's good to have you join us wherever you have gathered. We're going to bring our service to a close by saying from Mission Praise number 6 to 8, tell me the old, old story.
So now go in peace and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you, those whom you love and those whom you struggle to love, now and forevermore.